Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. Well, from time to time, I like to do videos like that have top 10 lists and uh, cover things like that. So if you have a suggestion for something along those lines that you'd like me to do a reaction to, let me know in the comment section below. But today we're going to take a look at a channel called Top 10s. I've never seen this channel before, but I was looking for something like this and stumbled across this video. It's Top 10 Historical Facts That Aren't True. I've done some things like this in the past, but I thought it'd be fun to dive into this one. We're going to go ahead and get right to it. Here we go. Hello, I'm Simon Whistler. You're watching Top 10's Net, and in the video today, we're looking at the top 10 historical facts that aren't actually true. Now, I'm going to go on and say this right off the top of my head here before we get started. A lot of times, I, I think people make assumptions about things that people believe that most people don't actually believe, especially those of us who love and study history. So some of these we'll probably look at and say, I, don't, I never thought that was true. But other ones, you know, maybe. But a lot of people that don't really pay much attention to history might believe some of these things. Number 10. Columbus was the first European to discover America. While this old belief has been largely expunged from the historical record today, at one point it was believed as a fact by generations of schoolchildren and is still maintained as true by some adults even today. Of course, the truth is that the Vikings preceded Columbus by centuries and may have even built small villages yep. in the New World hundreds of years before Columbus was born. Even if that weren't the case, however, from a purely technical perspective, Columbus never actually touched foot onto what what is today the United States, spending all of his time in the East Indies. No. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just let each one of these play all the way through before I react, just so I don't say something that then they're going to say anyway. Um, part of that with setting foot in the United States is just a matter of semantics. You know, here in the United States, we generally refer to ourselves as Americans. Uh, I recognize full well that there are a lot of other people in a lot of other countries that also consider themselves Americans in North and South America. Um, when I was in Central America, uh, at least my experience was that they referred to us there as uh, people in, in Central America refer to us as North Americans. Uh, so I, I get that. Um, and, and I know that probably rubs some people the wrong way that we call ourselves Americans, even though there are lots of other Americans. Uh, I've never heard anybody claim that Columbus discovered America from the standpoint of the United States of America. Uh, most of what Columbus set foot on was in the Caribbean. Uh, it was those islands down there um, that where all the cruise ships go today. Uh, he, he didn't even really set foot on North or South America. But yeah, um, I think most people understand that one's not true anymore, as is the, the case that Columbus was not this guy who suddenly discovered that the world was round. Uh, scientists had known this for thousands of years at this point. Uh, go back to the ancient uh, Greeks. They knew the world was round. Uh, there was nothing new there. Uh, what they didn't know was how big the earth was. Uh, and Columbus underestimated how large the earth was. Columbus thought it was smaller than it was and that he could easily get from the west coast of Spain to uh, Asia in uh, you know a month or two. And it turned out that there was a big continent in the way uh, and it was much, much further than he thought. What is today the United States spending all of his time in the East Indies? Number nine, people in Columbus's time thought that the world yeah, was Yeah, I just flat. covered that one. Closely related to the belief that Columbus discovered America is the belief, again, less prevalent today than it was half a century ago, that most people in his day believed the Earth was flat, and if Columbus sailed too far out, he would fall off its edge. In reality, the notion that the Earth was flat had been refuted by the ancient Greeks, who were even able to calculate its circumference with astonishing precision, and so was not held to be a fact by any but the most primitive cultures at the time. Number eight. Yeah, um, seems to be making a comeback, the whole flat Earth thing, uh, but we won't get into that today. Let's go ahead and dive into number eight. Hitler seized power in Germany by force. Many people hold the misconception that the Nazis seized power in Germany, but nothing could be further from the truth. The fact is that the Nazis came to power through free and fair elections, and even used the democratic process to secure that power. 
In effect, Adolf Hitler, appealing to the very legitimate grievances and fears of the German people, used the ballot box to achieve the powerful position of chancellor, and then used that very same process to destroy democracy by having the legislature grant him the emergency powers he convinced them was necessary to restore order. Now, that's a little bit of an over oversimplification, and I think it's being a little too charitable to, uh, to the Nazi party. Uh, yeah. Did they get power through elections? Yeah. Did they manipulate the system and basically bully their way into that power in free and fair elections? Also true. Uh, they kept, first of all, they used a lot of intimidation. They had the brown shirts. They had, you know, they had armed militias. They weren't unique in that. They weren't the only political party who had such things. They were the most effective at it. Uh, the communists and others had similar things. Uh, and were there legitimate grievances that they appealed to? Yes and no. Um, some of the grievances they appealed to had and fears had to do with things like the Jews, which weren't legitimate grievances. Um, so they used a mix of fear, but also legitimate economical issues that were happening. But I want to dive into this one a little bit further because I feel like it deserves more of an explanation. So there's so much we could get into here, but just a couple of highlights here. First of all, they did try to seize power uh, using force in Munich in what was called the Beer Hall Putsch. Um, and it's a, it's a coup that they try to stage in, in Munich in, uh, for the um, Bavarian government and eventually hoping it would spread to all of Germany. Uh, it's aided by people like Eric Ludendorff, who had kind of been all but a dictator at the end stages of World War I. Um, and it fails. He goes to jail. Uh power kind of shifts away from him and the party uh, while he's in jail, but then he seizes it back afterwards. He publishes his book, uh, forms the SA. Uh, in 1928, in the elections, they, they only get, the N NSDAP is, is re really what the name of the uh, National Socialist Party is, um, but uh, they only get 2.6% of the vote in 1928. Then you have the stock market crash, you have the economy uh, tanking even worse in Germany. It was already really bad. Uh, and then you start having more and more elections. But uh, Heinrich Bunig uh, takes charge in Germany uh, with a right-leaning coalition in 1930. Uh, and he actually invokes Article 48 of the Constitution, which allows the government to pass laws without consent of the Reichstag. And so this is even before the party takes power. You've got uh, this descent toward uh, dictatorship happening. Uh, and so you can't even blame them for that. September of 1930, they get 18% of the vote and they become the second largest party in the Reichstag. And so then what happens is they keep getting increasingly more of the vote and they kind of force things into new elections constantly. So every, you know, what, like, I don't know, maybe six months or so, they're having new elections. And every time uh, the National Socialists are taking more and more uh, of, uh, of the vote. And then Hitler runs against Hindenburg for president loses but forces a runoff election hindenburg wins that uh he wants uh, at this point july 31st of 1932 they get 37 percent so there's still only about a third of the reichstag um but this is when uh hitler then they force another vote and this time they actually lose votes uh hitler uh wants to be chancellor but they don't give him uh that position they give it to uh, franz von poppen instead uh but then eventually uh, poppen is forced to resign and then uh, he's made vice chancellor. Um, well, actually, he's forced out. Hindenburg appoints Kurt von Schleicher uh, as chancellor. Chancellor uh, Schleicher is then um, pushed out. And then they finally make Hitler chancellor in 1933. He immediately starts going in. He introduces censorship. Uh, the Reichstag fire happens. Who knows who set that off? But So there's a lot of manipulative things happening. So I think it's misleading to say that it was all free and fair and legit. There's a lot of shady stuff going on to get them into that position. And, and then once uh, the president dies, Hindenburg, in August of 1934, they merge those two positions, chancellor and president. And at that point, uh, he's firmly in place as a dictator the emergency powers he convinced them was necessary to restore order. Number 7. The stock market crash of 1929 started the Great Depression. 
Of all the misconceptions surrounding that dark era in American history, the idea that the crash of October 1929 kicked off the Great Depression is the most obstinate. The fact is that the Great Depression was caused by a number of factors, each of which went into making it a deeper and more enduring economic downturn than it would have been otherwise. Instead of letting the market make its own corrections and wait it out, they passed legislation, such as the Smoot-Hawley Act, that raised tariffs on imports, which was designed to make it cheaper to buy American products. The problem is, they didn't anticipate that foreign governments would raise tariffs on American goods in response, thereby killing exports and forcing the mass closure of many factories. Bad Government policies also caused many banks to fail, wiping out the life savings of millions of Americans, which further exacerbated the problem. So here's the problem with that one. What happens is uh, people like to point to events as saying, this is why this happened. This was the start of this thing. Uh, it's easy to do that because it prevents us from having to do a deep dive into things like tariffs and banks and regulations uh, and inflation and all that stuff. Was the stock market crash a major event? Yes. Did it have a huge impact on uh, the depression happening? Absolutely. Was it the reason the depression happened? No. Uh, but like most things in history, history is complicated. H history is full of factors. No one factor. You could say the same thing about World War I. When people say, well, the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand, Franz Ferdinand is the reason World War I happened. Yeah, but it didn't happen in a vacuum. That wasn't the only reason. There were a lot of reasons why World War I happened. That was one of the events that it's easy to point to and say, this is one of the events that triggered that. But it wasn't the only one. There was a lot of stuff that happened before that and a lot of stuff that happened after that that led to that war. So again, did it cause the depression by itself? No. Was it a major factor? Yes. And because we like to keep things simple and we don't like to just bash our heads against the wall studying all kinds of economic policy factors it's just an easy way of of saying this is one of the things that led to the depression out of the life savings of millions of americans which further exacerbated the problem number six japan had to attack america if it wanted to survive economically the belief that Japan was largely forced into attacking the United States because of the crippling embargo America had imposed upon it in response to its aggression in China is debatable. Japan had two options available to her other than attacking the Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor. First, it could have negotiated an end to her four-year-long war with China, which Japan was unwilling to do, or it could have simply seized the oil and mineral riches of the Dutch East Indies, modern-day Indonesia, and the Malay Peninsula directly without involving America at all. Consider for a moment that if the US was unwilling to go to war in Europe to assist Great Britain in its struggle with Nazi Germany, what were the chances Congress could have been persuaded to take on the Japanese over the Dutch East Indies and Malaysia? Number five. So um, that's an interesting one. I hadn't really thought about that second part of that. But the first part's true. Uh, right up until the moment Pearl Harbor was attacked, there was negotiation going on in Washington between the Japanese ambassadors uh, and the U.S. government trying to figure out a way to avoid going to war. Uh, but the sticking point for the U.S. was that Japan had to stop uh, its wars of aggression. Uh, now, would that have included the Dutch East Indies? I'm not sure I 100% agree with him that the U.S. would wouldn't have drawn a line in the sand if Japan had decided to seize the Dutch East Indies and go after that oil. Maybe not. Maybe there's not enough um, political support uh, or popular support for Roosevelt to go to war over that. I think it would have been heading in that direction increasingly. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's a fair point. Did they have to go to war? No. They could have negotiated, they could have stopped their other wars and the U.S. probably would have dropped the embargo. Uh, and then who knows what might have happened. But it's an interesting thought. What do you think about that one? Let me know. Persuaded to take on the Japanese over the Dutch East Indies and Malaysia. 
Number five. If Lee had won at Gettysburg, the South would have won the Civil War. No chance. No it chance. It is widely believed that the Union victory at Gettysburg in July of 1863 prevented the North from complete collapse, but a careful look at the overall strategic situation at the time demonstrates this to have been unlikely. Agree. First, even if Lee had routed Meade's army at Gettysburg, it would have come at considerable cost, especially considering the number of Union troops Lee faced, over 90,000, compared to his own 70,000 men. This means that even if he had been victorious, Lee would have emerged from the battle with a largely exhausted and depleted force left with which to march on Washington almost 100 miles away. Additionally, Gettysburg would have been only the first in a string of obstacles he would have had to overcome as he moved east. Eventually, he would have to retreat back into Virginia in any case, and though he could add another Confederate victory to the long list of victories Lee had enjoyed up to that point in the war, the South simply couldn't match the North's almost unlimited industrial capability and was doomed to eventually lose in any case. Yeah, I've said this many times before. The only way the South was winning that war was by winning it the same way that the United States won its Revolutionary War. Uh, which was the help from foreign powers. Um, South needed Europe. They needed France. They needed Britain. They needed Spain. They needed somebody on their side uh, to help break up the blockade, to help financially, to help militarily. Short of that, it just wasn't happening. It just was not happening. Let's say Lee wins at Gettysburg. Let's say Pickett's charge breaks Meade's line. Lee's got less than 50,000 men left. He's got 10,000 or more wounded that he's got to deal with. He's deep in enemy lines. He's not marching on Washington. Washington was the most fortified city on earth at that point. He was not taking Washington with the army that he had. It just wasn't going to happen. Uh, also, at that point, Pennsylvania was raising tens of thousands of militia units that even then were in the process of being sent in that direction. So he Lee still would have been outnumbered probably two to one, even after a victory there. The uh, Army of the Potomac would have fallen back somewhere into Maryland between Lee and Washington. Uh, Lee was not in any position at that point to move on to Philadelphia or somewhere like that. He was going to have to fall back to Virginia or he was going to have to pursue Meade's army in Washington. And meanwhile, Vicksburg still happens, and that's the real turning point of the war anyway. That cripples the South economically even more than it already had been. He, he's 100% right. It didn't make a difference. Number four, Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation freed the slaves. Most students grow up believing that the Emancipation Proclamation freed the slaves, but it did no such thing. First of all, it only applied to slaves living within the Confederate States, and since the North had no power to enforce the proclamation in those territories not under its direct control, it really had no immediate effect on freeing anyone. In fact, it didn't even free those slaves in the Northern States, where slave ownership, while uncommon, was still legal. It was only illegal to buy and sell slaves in the North, not own them. It would take the 13th Amendment, ratified in 1865, to do that, and it applied throughout the country, not just parts of it. I will disagree with one thing he said there where it didn't really free any slaves. Uh, there were large parts, by the time the Emancipation Proclamation takes effect, New Orleans, which is by far the largest city in the Confederacy, is under Union control. Uh, large parts of Tennessee are under Union control, parts of Arkansas, uh, parts, not much of Virginia, but some of Virginia, um, parts of Mississippi are under uh, Union control. Uh, so there are, Louisiana, uh, there are areas where this applied and took immediate effect. In fact, a lot of these slaves start making their way into the Union Army then. Uh, and you have these units, and this is what makes it possible for things like the 54th and 55th Massachusetts, the 1st Kansas Colored. There were Louisiana uh, units uh, in the Union Army. Um, and, and so a lot of that is starting to happen, and it means that moving forward as the Union armies march further south, any areas that come under the control, East Tennessee, uh, northern Mississippi, northern Alabama, Georgia, uh, these are going to become areas that then those slaves can become freed as well. But yes, once the war was over, uh, all of that might have been rolled back. And then what do you do with all these people that have been freed? Do you re-enslave them? Um, and I think the fact that Union soldiers fought 
uh, a lot of people saw that as the reason they had to pass the 13th Amendment because they said, how on earth can we tell these men who fought and bled uh, for the Union that we're taking away their freedom and sending them back to slavery when the war is over? It just was inconceivable to them. So that was a big reason why they were able to push for the 13th Amendment's passage. It applied in 1865 to do that, and it applied throughout the country, not just parts of it. Number three, Lindbergh was the first person to fly across the Atlantic. Non-stop. While Lucky Lindsay won fame and fortune for his daring solo jaunt across the Atlantic in 1927, he was far from the first to cross the ocean by air. In fact, two British pilots, Alcock and Brown, had made the crossing years earlier in a repurposed RAF bomber. They flew from St. John's, Newfoundland to Galway Island in just under 16 hours in 1919. That flight paved the way for commercial transportation Atlantic aviation and made Lindbergh's future flight possible. Further, just a couple of weeks after the British duo had made their flight, the British airship R-34, with a couple of dozen crew and passengers on board, made a double crossing, taking about four days to cross both ways. In fact, by the time Lindbergh made his world-famous crossing, close to 80 men had already made the epic journey. He was solo. His, however, was done entirely solo, and clocking in at almost 34 hours of straight flying time, was a far more challenging and grueling feat. Yeah, uh, it was a solo flight across the Atlantic, and that was the difference. Uh, that was what made it a big deal. And, um, and and then Amelia Earhart was attempting to be the first woman to do solo around the world. Um, so yeah, he explained that one well. There's nothing more to add to that. Number two, Custer's 7th Cavalry was wiped out. Part of it. Little Bighorn. While many assumed that Custer's entire command was wiped out at the Battle of Little Bighorn in June of 1876, the truth is that less than half of the 647 men under his command were killed in the famous battle. The reason for this was twofold. First, some of his men were assigned to drive and guard the lengthy wagon train that followed in the army's wake, and so were too far away at the time to be involved. And secondly, Custer had divided his command between himself and Major Reno in an effort to make a two-pronged attack. Reno uh, actually, had divided into three. Uh, let me let him finish first. Nose assault, which preceded Custer's by an hour or so, was driven off with heavy casualties, but most of it emerged from the battle intact. It was only those companies that rode with Custer, about 210 men in all, that were entirely wiped out. Uh, he actually divided into three. He had a, a part that was under Captain Benteen. Uh, the t there were two parts that made the attack, but Captain Benteen was back, and he was supposed to wait for the packs, the, the supplies, to come up and then bring those to Custer. Uh, and there was a lot of controversy around the fact that he's like, well, I have to wait for the packs. I can't, I can't go to his aid until the packs get here. And then... Um, we're going to go there, uh, hopefully sometime this year, I'm going to go there and talk about that battle in depth. But yeah, it was, it was the companies under Custer's direct command, which included several of his relatives. Um, I think two of his brothers, uh, his brother, Tom and his brother, Boston were both killed. His brother, Boston was a civilian, but was along. And then he also had a cousin and I think a brother-in-law that were along. So a lot of family members, uh, of his died in that rode with Custer, about 210 men in all, that were entirely wiped out. Number one, the USA. And I should mention, too, uh, interesting fact about that, the 7th Cavalry, it's the same 7th Cavalry that will then uh, commit what we know today as the massacre at Wounded Knee, uh, where hundreds of Native Americans were killed in 1890, right at the end of what we call the Plains Indian Divorce. Um, that was the 7th Cavalry. And also the 7th Cavalry was the unit, if you've ever seen the movie, um, We Were Soldiers with Mel Gibson and Sam Elliott and others, the Battle of Iadrang, which kind of was like the first big battle the U.S. was involved in in the Vietnam War. That was also the 7th Cavalry. They was chiefly responsible for defeating Germany in World War I, I don't think anybody thinks World that. War II. While American material and... I, I'm going to stop before he even starts this one because... All the time, I get people from other countries saying, why do Americans think that they won World War II and World War I by themselves? I'm sure there are Americans who think that, but I've never heard it. I don't know any Americans who think that we won those wars on our own. Um, I feel like that's one of those perceptions that people perceive to be true that really doesn't have a lot of basis in fact. 
but maybe I'm wrong. I, I, and listen, I know, I know there are, you could probably point to me, point me to Americans who have said that, but that doesn't mean the majority of us think that. Military support was imperative and likely ensured an eventual Allied victory. It was others who bore the brunt of the fighting against Germany in both wars. In World War I, the US was late to the show, not making it to France in significant numbers until late in 1917. It was the British and French who had been doing all of the fighting up until then and had battered the Germans. On the Western Front, the British and French. We cannot forget about the Italians and the Serbians and the... Uh, and the Russians, I mean, they all suffered significant casualties too in other countries too. ...by the time the US entered the fray. In the Second World War, things were much the same, with American troops not arriving in theater until very late in the war. While they fought largely... I gotta take exception to him saying not arriving in theater until late in the war. US troops were on the ground fighting in 1942. Uh, in Africa, uh, as well as in the Pacific. Uh, that's not very late in the war. That's um, a little over two years into the war, two, two and a half years in. Um, nobody was fighting on the Western Front in Europe uh, on the ground until 1944, uh, and that includes the U.S., but rear guard actions in North Africa and Italy, by the time they landed in force in France in June 1944, the Germans were already reeling from the massive Soviet juggernaut yep. that was rolling over them from the east. But that massive Soviet juggernaut was due in large part to supplies, money, uh, and, and things of that nature coming from the Allies, including the United States. Um, I don't know... I'm not saying the Soviets couldn't have been successful on the Eastern Front without that, but they would have had a much harder time. Um, but yeah, by, by, by the time D-Day happens, uh, Germany's going to lose the war in Europe with or without, without a second front. I think that's fair to say. In fact, over 80% of all German casualties in World War II came on the Eastern Front. While it was the US that was chiefly responsible for defeating Japan in the Pacific, it was the Soviet Union that did most of the heavy lifting in Europe. Fair. So I really hope you found that. All right, so let me know what you thought about that. Uh, use the comment section below. If there's another like top 10 list or something of this nature you'd like me to do a reaction to, uh, use the comment section below and let me know that. Uh, be watching tomorrow. Next episode from France will be coming out. This one I've really been looking forward to editing. This is going to be the Douaumont Ossuary and Cemetery. One of the most um, profound experiences I've ever had in making a video um, at a historic site. It was pretty overwhelming, so I hope you'll check that out. Thanks.